The Old Man in the Sea, Part 11. No, he said. He can't be that big. But he was that big. And at the end of this circle, he came to the surface only 30 yards away. And the man saw his tail out of the water. It was higher than a big scythe blade, a very pale lavender above the dark blue water. It raked back, and as the fish swam just below the surface, the old man could see his huge bulk and the purple stripes that banded him. His dorsal fin was down, and his huge pectorals were spread wide. On this circle, the old man could see the fish's eye and the two gray sucking fish that swam around him. Sometimes they attached themselves to him. Sometimes they darted off. Sometimes they would swim easily in his shadow. They were each over three feet long, and when they swam fast, they lashed their whole bodies like eels. The old man was sweating now from something else besides the sun. On each calm, placid turn the fish made, he was gaining line, and he was sure that in two turns more, he would have a chance to get the harpoon in. But he must get him close, 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 he thought. I mustn't try for the head. I must get the heart. Be calm and strong, old man, he said. On the next circle, the fish's neck was out, but he was a little too far from the boat. On the next circle, he was still too far away, but he was higher out of the water, and the old man was sure that by gaining some more line, he could have him alongside. He had rigged his harpoon long before, and its coil of light rope was in a round basket, and the end was made fast to the bit in the bow. The fish was coming in on his circle now, calm and beautiful looking, and only his great tail moving. The old man pulled on him all that he could to bring him closer. For just a moment, the fish turned a little on his side, then he straightened himself and began another circle. I moved him, the old man said. I moved him then. He felt faint again now, but he held on the great fish all the strain that he could. I moved him, he thought. Maybe this time I can get him over. Pull hands, he thought. Hold up, legs. Last for me, head. Last for me. You never went. This time I'll pull him over. But when he put all his effort on, starting it well out before the fish came alongside and pulling with all his strength, the fish pulled part way over and then righted himself and swam away. Fish, the old man said. Fish, you're going to have to die anyway. Do you have to kill me too? That way nothing is accomplished, he thought. His mouth was too dry to speak, but he could not reach for the water now. I must get him alongside this time, he thought. I am not good for many more turns. Yes, you are, he told himself. You're good forever. On the next turn, he nearly had him, but again the fish righted himself and swam slowly away. You are killing me, fish, the old man thought, but you have a right to. Never have I seen a greater or more beautiful or calmer or more noble thing than you, brother. Come on and kill me. I do not care who kills who. Now you are getting confused in the head, he thought. You must keep your head clear. Keep your head clear and know how to suffer like a man. Or a fish, he thought. Clear up, head, he said in a voice he could hardly hear. Clear up. Twice more, it was the same on the turns. I do not know, the old man thought. He had been on the point of feeling himself go each time. I do not know but I will try it once more. He tried it once more and he felt himself going when he turned the fish. The fish righted himself and swam off again, slowly with the great tail weaving in the air. I'll try it again, the old man promised, although his hands were mushy now and he could only see well in flashes. He tried it again, it was the same. So he thought and he felt himself going before he started. I will try it once again. He took all his pain and what was left of his strength and his long gone pride and he put it against the fish's agony and the fish came over onto his side and swam gently on his side. 
his bill almost touching the planking of the skiff and started to pass the boat, long, deep, wide, silver, and barred with purple, interminable in the water. The old man dropped the line and put his foot on it and lifted the harpoon as high as he could and drove it down with all his strength and more strength he had just summoned into the fish's side just behind the great chest fin that rose high in the air to the altitude of the man's chest. He felt the iron go in and he leaned on it and drove it further and then pushed all his weight after it. Then the fish came alive with his death in him and rose high out of the water showing all his great length and width and all his power and his beauty. He seemed to hang in the air above the old man in the skiff. Then he fell into the water with a crash that sent spray over the old man and over all of the skiff. The old man felt faint and sick and he could not see well, but he cleared the harpoon line and let it run slowly through his raw hands. And when he could see, he saw the fish was on his back with his silver belly up. The shaft of the harpoon was projecting at an angle from the fish's shoulder and the sea was discoloring with the red of the blood from his heart. First, it was dark as a shoal in the blue water that was more than a mile deep. Then it spread like a cloud. The fish was silvery and still and floated with the waves. The old man looked carefully in the glimpse of vision that he had. Then he took two turns of the harpoon line around the bit in the bow and hid his head in his hands. Keep my head clear, he said against the wood of the bow. I am a tired old man, but I've killed this fish, which is my brother, and now I must do the slave work. Now I must prepare the nooses and the rope to lash him alongside, he thought. Even if we were two and swamped her to load him and bail her out, this skiff would never hold him. I must prepare everything, then bring him in and lash him well, and step the mast and set sail for home. He started to pull the fish in to have him alongside so that he could pass a line through his gills and out his mouth and make his head fast alongside the bow. I want to see him, he thought, and to touch and to feel him. He is my fortune, he thought, but that is not why I wish to feel him. I think I felt his heart, he thought. Then I pushed on the harpoon shaft a second time. Bring him in now and make him fast and get the noose around his tail and another around his middle to bind him to the skiff. Get to work, old man, he said. He took a very small drink of water. There is very much slave work to be done now that the fight is over. He looked up at the sky and then out to his fish. He looked at the sun carefully. It is not much more than noon now, he thought, and the trade wind is rising. The lines will mean nothing now. The boy and I will splice them when we are home. Come on, fish, he said, but the fish did not come. Instead, he lay there wallowing now in the sea, and the old man pulled the skiff upon to him. When he was even with him and had the fish's head against the bow, he could not believe its size. But he untied the harpoon rope from the bit, passed it through the fish's gills and out his jaws, made a turn around his sword, and then passed the rope through the other gills made another turn around the bill and knotted the double rope and made it fast to the bit in the bow. He cut the rope then and went astern to noose the tail. The fish had turned silver from its original purple and silver, and the stripes showed the same pale violet color as his tail. They were whiter than a man's hand with his fingers spread, and the fish's eye looked as detached as the mirrors in a periscope or as a saint in a procession. It was the only way to kill him, the old man said. He was feeling better since the water, and he knew he would not go away and his head was clear. He's over 1,500 pounds the way he is, he thought. Maybe much more. If he dresses out two-thirds of that at 30 cents a pound. I need a pencil for that, he said. My head is not that clear. But I think the great DiMaggio would be proud of me today. I had no bone spurs, but the hands and the back hurt truly. I wonder what a bone spur is, he thought. Maybe we have them without knowing it. 
And we're going to pause here and continue with this story in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've subscribed to our channel. I hope you've clicked like down below. And please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Guys know I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Bye-bye.